Yeah. Uh, welcome back. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank you again, Wing Tai, for giving us an in depth report on what we have arrived since our last workshop and paving the way uh, for our coming lecture today. Uh, before we start, may I introduce and extend our welcome to two visitors from England. They are Dr. Dennis Alexander and also Dr. Andrew Jackson uh, from Faraday Institute, Cambridge. They are very good friends of John Wyatt, so I hope we could greet one another uh, through the uh, Skype uh, later. Okay, now we should start our first talk. May I introduce you uh, our first speaker today, Professor Lauren Fisher. Uh, just retired after 30 years of service uh, from Hong Kong Baptist University including being the head of religion department from 2010 to 2011 and the director of Center for Sino-Christian Studies from 2012 to 2017. His talk today is on searching for Christian values that could redeem technological systems, complications, challenges, and confirmations. I'm sure they would be very enlightening, provoking, and also illuminating. So without any delay, so we welcome Lauren with a big applause of hands. What uh, Brother Wing Tai has uh, already given us overwhelms me. So I don't know, my sisters and brothers, how you, you handle that. The, the information overload is part of this technological condition that we're in. Uh, and yet, that's why we're here. Uh, I hope that you don't feel so overwhelmed that we can't engage. And I'll try to work at things from a very different kind of uh, angle and also, yes, I, I have a way when I get reflective, I, I will be quieter. Yes, thank you. Ah, yes, and this is the technological way to make me a monster. <laughs> All right, we understand that, okay. So you've heard something about my, my you know, academic professional background, but also, I would want to say I'm a grandfather with my wife. Uh, we're grandparents of five children. Uh, to see life come again um, from two to nine now and, uh, and engage them has been wonderfully, wonderfully enriching. Hmm? But also deeply challenging. You know? Also moving from 30 years of being here in Hong Kong, you know, Yong Yu Yu, yeah. We can do that. I, I, I've pursued that and then to go back into a Trump era US uh, with a you know, anti-Obama kind of setting with fissured uh, cultural and institutional uh, adjustments that we have to align ourselves to has been exceptionally difficult really hard. Then on top of it, we made some very bold and radical steps of, of choosing to live at 9,000 feet high, 3,000 meters in the Rocky Mountains because my Swiss blood and my, my wife's Filipino genes, you know, love the mountains, you know. And then we discovered, that's hard. <laughs> you have to, you know, it, you, we're here in the wonderful technologically advanced settings of, of Hong Kong and even Sha Tin. Yes, yes, Sha Tin is still technologically advanced. Some people don't believe that in Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, we relied on 
our management systems and on the on the technicians and skill. Now, if the septic tank, which I never knew what it was, septic tank goes wrong, I have to fix it. You know? Yeah. Who? <laughs> a learning curve. Yo, know, I feel like it's been really amazing, and that's important. I have been thinking and interacting with numerous people as a consequence of these preparations in these ways and feeling very existentially feeling very vulnerable. You know? um, the anthology that we have has a, a direction to it and I, though it's very thick and I, I, I read at least about um, a third of it now you know, and, and I saw that Wing Tai also reread uh, sections of it that we heard today. If you look at it, the first part of it is dealing with the history of technologies from Greek, ancient Greek and others. It doesn't deal with other ancient traditions, Egyptian, uh, Syrian, for example, or Chinese or Indian. But, you know, what it does is set out the kinds of concerns for tool making and tool development and things that Wing Tai mentioned, but then at the end, that's not even a question. It's not a, cool, a concern about tools, it's concerned about technological environment. Uh, the last whole section is developed with the politics of technologies. And they'll use the term technologies, technical systems, technical you know, uh, methods, but they're deeply rooted into things like, for example, a book published 2015, uh, Harvard University Press, normally known for doing certain things that are a little bit bold. Scientists at War, the Ethics of Cold War Weapons Research. Most engineers I know in the USA are funded by military research, no matter what they're doing. That's not neutral. Hmm? Bulletin of Atomic Science. No, that's not, I mean that. I, I mean to put it there. Bulletin of, uh, of Atomic Science. It's, it's part of the drama. <laughs> there, over there. Okay. <laughs> Try to get that out, you know. No. No. This is, this is Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. You know, I don't read this journal regularly. Hmm? <laughs> but I did go, 2012. Nuclear scientists as assassination targets. An academic article on Iranian atomic scientists saying, why do you want to kill them? You know, they're just scientists. You know? How about bad science used to support torture and human experimentation? Psychologists informing you know, military personnel how to make people talk. Hmm? Uh, Chronicle of Higher Education, they even get in it. Yes. 2015, July, after damning revelations, social science rethinks ties to military. Not only psychology, anthropologists. Anthropologists used in Afghanistan to serve as counter, uh, what they call counterinsurgency informants. Hmm? The moral morality of military anthropology and the person writing this in the Journal of Military Ethics is opposed to it. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists again. The Enhanced Warfighter. Hmm? Atomic scientists. Are they talking about what you do to the atoms of the world? No, 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 no. Yeah. What they're talking about is uh, how to provide Alter, alterations to the human body by equipping it with AI, you know, visual, for example, night vision, other things of this sort. How to supplement their, uh, their intake in terms of feeding, you know, so that they will be more energetic. How to enhance uh, medical operations so that even if they're wounded, they can get back onto the war field quicker? Does this neutral? Doesn't sound like it to me. Sounds like it has very, very practical, utilitarian, but 
direct relationships to political and military and social factors that are not at all machines, not at all limited to engineers or physicists. Or they're, they're involving wide ranges of human activity that include much that we do at university levels. Okay. So at this point, I want to try to indicate that I'm doing something, as far as I know, I haven't seen it in any of the literature I've reviewed. Uh, so I'm dangerous. Beware. Okay? I'm going to try to work through the complications to get to certain commitments. And Brother Wing Tai has been pointing out some of those commitments, and I think very creatively in this you know, nine-step system. You'll see some of that coming through what I'm doing here. Okay? I, the general outline of what I'm going to do is, is tied up here. I think there are some conceptual and methodological complications we need to be self-conscious of, and some of those came through questions that were raised. Um, I'm going to rely on, my boldness comes in that I'm going to focus on uh, Jacques Ellul, the um, 20th century, uh, um, I will say polymath. You know, he was a uh, legal historian, he was uh, a very notable, probably one of the most notable, he, he would not call himself philosopher, but a sociologist of technology and systems and wrote three massive volumes on this. And then also theologically very active and uh, particularly involved in, in Christian communities of the reform tradition in a very Catholic France. You know, so quite an unusual and sometimes quite marginalized figure. And I'll explain both what I take from him and what I find troublesome. You know? and then I'll move toward ways I want to suggest, and I've given you four worksheets, to try to work toward self-consciousness of adopting certain Christian values here. And for those specifically working in the natural sciences and teaching, all of us are colleagues. I, I um, respect so much that we can be together. You, know, you are, this is a remarkable, gathering of spirits, you know, and minds and experiences. But I want to answer even some of these military issues with pugwash conferences and Joseph Rotblat, you know, who had the courage to go as a, as a Jewish UK man against the trends of the, of the US in World War II and then ended up 50 years later getting a Nobel Peace Prize, but creating a lot more self-consciousness of the social you know, responsibilities of scientists, you know. That's also part of this self-reflection. That's peacemaking. But can we be bold enough? Do we have the moral courage to do that? Those are issues that we all have to, you know, at least address. And I hope that we can encourage each other in this way. And then finally, forming and f framing and forming some Christian commitments in response to uh, words that you will find often in, in Ilul's uh, uh, literature, technological systems or environment. So allow me to move at this point uh, toward some of these matters. One of the real difficulties in the contemporary uh, anthology on philosophy of technology, notice it is, that's the main title, notice the subtitle. Huh? the technological condition, yeah? Why do you write an anthology? Because no one agrees. And you press out people, you, know, you say here are the positions, here are the general areas, but the, as I've already indicated, this anthology is not neutral either. Hmm? It starts with looking at what would be uh, ancient Greek and uh, not moving into medieval traditions much at all, where Mumford really saw deeper things in a much broader range. But then it, by the end, it is talking about the political implications of technological systems and why they're so problematic. You know, there's no question about it. That's significant. So for us to think about it, and here, allow me to assume that we are at least going to f give precedence to certain Christian values that in this process of becoming self-reflective, we have to start asking, what are we talking about? 
And this was the very first thing that uh, Brother Wing Tai mentioned. We have to describe it. Elul is very, very explicit. We, you, when you read the articles and we talk together, we talk about tools, techniques, skills. We use technology in the singular, sometimes in the plural. Science, is science singular or is it sciences? Our, our colleagues from the Faraday, Faraday Institute, I'm sure. We can talk about that. You know, the methods, they become more and more specialized. And we, you know, Brother Wing Tai again already mentioned that. Uh, you know, this sets up conditions and creates environments and I'll refer to the Chernobyl, famous Chernobyl incident, you know, with the destruction of the nuclear plant, the self-destruction of it, <sighs> and its impossibility to control at certain points in critical marginal settings. What's amazing is today I came here by means of KMB bus and MTR. I didn't have to think at all. I just had to walk around and you know at a certain time say, oh yeah, I get out here, and then, oh yeah, I get out, you know, and I can be here. And I don't even have to to have any concern whatsoever of who's driving that, can I trust them or anything. That's one of the positive dimensions, this kind of ambiguity that we have that we can live in this but it also can kill us. And I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, that has something to do with the way Jahlul, in the reading I gave you, a uh, book published five years before he died, uh, What I Believe, uh, you know, he, he began to set out this idea. What I found in Jahlul's conception of the technological system and environment has been most helpful and the way I've dealt with it, I want you to know, is number three. I have a pragmatic standard of assessment. It came from my training. I have a, I have a seminary degree, an MDiv degree, and then I did a master in philosophy and, uh, and a PhD in comparative philosophy with a Chinese emphasis working on 19th and 20th century areas in that realm and comparing that with European and North American. Uh, philosophy, political philosophy. But I was taught by Gordon Lewis, if a particular worldview or particular perception answers more questions and leaves less problematic, you know, problems, you know, problematic issues, then it is a better perspective than others. When I use Elul's approach and I compare it to Heidegger, I compare it to Mumford, I compare it to uh, others that we've mentioned, uh, and we have some others, Mitchum and others here. I find it heuristically better. I find it helpful, and this is what I'm giving to you. I've given it to my undergraduate students. I've, I've promoted it in various realms, especially in environmental ethics in China. You know, I found a lot of resistance. Because people will say in China, oh, we just have heaven and human and earth. You know? And I say, where's technology? Is it human? Or is it, is it natural? And they say, no, 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 no. There's such beauty in nature. And I say, well, how do you see it through your glasses? You know? Is that natural? Your, your shoes, your hiking boots, and everything else that you do to hike, walk up to, you know, Fujiyama, you know? Is this just natural? Are we not mediated by all these things? Are, is our, not our experience, our phenomena, our knowledge mediated? I find that really difficult for many of my uh, Chinese colleagues in philosophy to accept. And yet they're so embedded in it, as one uh, colleague here said, yeah, it's sort of like uh, sitting, you know, if you, we're, we're all goldfish in the, in the bowl, and you have to tell them what water is, you know? It's not so easy to become self-conscious of this thing. Hmm? When you compare, I mean, uh, because Brother Wing Tai has really dealt with the non-neutrality, and I've tried to dramatically indicate that, uh, at the beginning here. I want to just indicate that you see there are two articles of Elul in this, in this anthology. I will be using one part of, one, of the first, 
but then the article by Mumford, uh, Heidegger, Jonas, and Ida, he tends to stand against Mumford because Mumford doesn't see the incredible uh, newness of post-World War II technologies, but he does see the megastructure when humans become part of the system and they can be enslaved. And the question is, are we more free now? No. Heidegger could speak about both the danger and the hope for finding this conviviality, but he tended to work with tools and not with a system. And it was only the atom bomb after World War II that made him see the danger, but he didn't know, I don't think he, he could perceive the profundity of it. And Ellul knew that he had been a Nazi. And he said, from that time on, I never read him. You know, he said, anyone who could commit himself and make such a political error has too many fundamental problems. You know, Mm. Wow. You know, philosophers don't like to talk about that. You know, the Kyoto School, lining to the, the Japanese. We don't want to talk about lining to Mao Zedong here, you know, you know in the Cultural Revolution. Oh, you know, trying to ask why did philosophers like Feng Yulan, you know, ultimately become a mouthpiece for Mao Zedong in 1975? Because he went through propaganda and techniques of propaganda. Jacques Ellul has written the classic book on propaganda, The Formation of Men's Attitudes. It's out here. The second appendix is on Mao Zedong's use of propaganda. And his, uh, his assessment is, amazingly, you think that Mao Zedong is strange, but the same methods of propaganda are being used in advertising techniques in other parts of the modern world. They're not essentially different. Shocking. But it is then aligned to Hans Jonas, a German scholar, very good. He writes quite a bit in this article about the non neutrality of research systems, you know, and how they integrate into. So, what we've heard about certain biases in our academic traditions, but also just how they have been created and recreated and now online and you what used to be able to write in by typing in an hour or two takes 15 hours now online because you can't figure out how to upload that lousy last part you know all of us know about this you know so is it that effective and helpful not necessarily hmm? Ida does something very sophisticated phenomenologically, and I mention him because he helps me answer my Chinese colleagues who see themselves still embedded in nature, and he's saying, I'm sorry, all this is mediated by a lot more technical things than you, you want to be self-conscious about. You should be, but you aren't. So Ida is worth reading, uh, and Jonas and Ida are aligned with Elul in seeing what? the bigger issues of technological environment. I'm doing something very Protestant. I want you to be aware of it. I'm not Eastern Orthodox. Uh, I'm not promoting that. There are some very good things. There, also in the Roman Catholic social teachings are very rich. They're worth considering, but they're a lot more philosophically and theologically complicated. And so what I have I've created here, I even focus specifically not on 20th century documents, but I'm going to give you some New Testament matters from gospel, just basic values and Pauline epistles to provoke some sensitivity. We start with seeing where the points of resistance arise and then hopefully can move beyond that. Okay? And let me just... Welcome, John. Thank you for being with us from UK. I'm sorry that you have to endure me first. <laughs> so there are implications with my methods. I am specifically going to emphasize the grand uh, picture of technological systems environment. And then I'm going to uh, give you a more Protestant approach to things that I hope will be still provocative in spite of its uh, maybe paucity of uh, concerns. Here is a quotation that you have in, located in the anthology. It's the closest thing we have in the Lul for definition. Technique 
Latihik, he would call, and so how you translate that? Some say technological society, some say, uh, you know, the technology. But he's, it's la technique is the totality of methods rationally arrived at, and having absolute efficiency for a given stage of development in every field of human activity. He means every field, and he continues to say, I cannot tell you this. It's impossible for me to comprehend the whole of it, which is remarkable for someone who's written 50 books. You know, it's, he is honest in that. He's humble in that, even though he says, I have a, a big problem with arrogance. That's my biggest sin. You know, um, nonetheless, its characteristics are new. The technique of the present has no common measure with that of the past. So to use technique and not tools or technology, Lul describes this as the technological system and the technological environment, and he means by that that this holistic activity, uh, so not just in machines, but what I've talked about with regard to psychology, anthropology, uh, even uh, nutrition, could be implied in all of this, especially when it's applied in more, uh, we could say, um, more intense kind of conditions such as military complex. Okay. It's based on what I call techno values. This is my neologism for it, but it is a lul who's had it. What you have is a system of tensed values. The fastest, the cheapest, and that which has the most impact. And they don't, if you work on this, now worksheet number one says, okay, why did you get your cell phone? There's 600 different kinds of cell phone now, okay? And you know why. It's the cheapest, you know? But does it work better than, oh yes, I had paid a little bit more because, you know? And he said, that's exactly the way this works. It's autonomous, you know? People who are in the technical realms don't necessarily have to be driven to create new values because these values, in, as they are jostled against each other, help to create you know, new well, kinds of alternatives, okay? You can see this in that worksheet number one. And once you get it, then you can get into some of the other conditions. Now, let me go to three here. The technological environment. An environment, uh, later Lo talks about, it enables us to live, it puts us in danger, it is immediate to us, and it mediates everything. Now, that conception needs to be worked out in a number of ways. In October, in the community where I'm involved, there was an 84-year-old grandmother who went to purchase uh, materials at the local store, returned home, uh, put her, uh, it, it, she, she drove the vehicle, you know, somewhat frail, but she drove the vehicle anyway. She could manage it. She was very happy to be able to do this on her own went behind the vehicle uh, on the carport, and as she was taking out the food, the brakes failed. She was run over and killed immediately. Now the car was not made for that, but it did it. One of our co-eds at Hong Kong Baptist University uh, earlier this year was running, doing her daily jogging with headphones, listening to Canto Pop, you know, that has, you know, it's fairly loud, you know. And as she was running along, just went into the street right in front of a K KMB bus. Gone. Now the bus wasn't, is not a murder machine. You know, we learned that too from Jetson 9-11, right? Yeah. Hey, right. it's not a murder machine, but it, can, it, it puts us in danger. That's the kind of matter that even ends up being put in, for example, with Chernobyl, number four. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists have done this study very, very carefully. And they said, you know, the computer mechanisms and the information systems at Chernobyl worked. They told that it was the, the explosion was going to happen, and it was all documented in five seconds. No single human being or team of human beings could have stopped it. It was just too quick. 
the environment that has been created by us creative human beings can endanger us so much that we are overwhelmed. And it can be destructive. Beyond what we intend, it's not our intention for it. But this is what can happen, and unfortunately did in that context. So there are advantages and disadvantages with the Lowell's system and his approach. He, as you can see, he was very engaged with actual conditions that were in Bordeaux and, uh, and in post-World War II France. But he also has had some, uh, he's, he tends to be on the margins of theological discussions. You know, he's fairly radical uh, and pessimistic in his political agenda. And I find that not so helpful. Hmm? He does say we ought to learn self-consciousness by learning resistance. So can we gain enough insight to know when we should question things? Mm -hmm. This is where worksheet two and three are involved. And I'm going to uh, go there. But uh, promoting creation of institutions like the Pugwash you know, con conferences and others, there's just so much here. But even in our homes, you know, how do we work out family meals, you know? And where are the tension points, you know? Oh, did you turn off that light? <laughs> uh, that, that can become a point of contention in a marriage, you know? Oh, wow, yeah. Huh? So I've asked something very simple here. How does the fastest, the cheapest, and the, and the most impactful relate to loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength? Where does that lie? God's love involves the Redeemer dying on the cross. That doesn't seem very, very cheap. How do I love my neighbor as myself? That's extremely complex. It doesn't work out so easily, especially when my neighbor speaks another language and may be illiterate, as it happens that my Hispanic neighbor in the little town of Thornton, next to my, my parents' residence, is. He's perfectly competent orally in English and, and Spanish, but he cannot read. And he works, and he lives. But how do I love this guy? It it's really takes time. It's not efficient. Is love then technologically deleted? I don't have time for that. You know? Please don't bother me with that. You know? I had a, a public discussion with a colleague in our university, who I will not name, <laughs> full professor in the IT. And as we were discussing uh, internet addiction, one of our younger colleagues, who admitted to be partially addicted, said, what do you do, sir, if you have a child, one of your students that you're mentoring who admits to being addicted? He says, that's his problem. I'm not a counselor. I'm doing research. I, I want to do what I want to do. You know, I would tell him to go to the counselor. No love, not just for neighbors, but even our students. Can we do that? Is there not a provocation? Is there not some resistance here? I have, uh, for example, in uh, Nicholas Carr, The Great Switch, he, the last chapter is called Disconnectopia. He and his family were working out, they were writers and others, all working out. He said, we, with our 14-year-old son, were sitting before screens, and we would not even talk to each other. We would send SMS messages to each other, even though we were sitting next to each other. Mm. He said, we became, in our family, infantile. And they decided, having become somewhat self-conscious, they said, at Friday at 5 o'clock, we turn off the computer. We will not turn it on until Monday at 9. They told all their friends, and they said, how can you do that? <laughs> you, you don't 
dare do that? I said, well, yes, we can. We can invite you over. Let's have dinner. You know? And they said the first two weeks was really terrible. You know? And they finally, because you know, it, it was possible to have a hurricane come, you know, so they finally kept one cell phone on. You know? But they were able, they, they discovered each other again. They could talk to each other. They could go out to the park. They could be with friends. And they had not been doing that because they had gotten themselves so much engaged in getting at things, succeeding efficiently. Technofast, learned it from my niece. Yes, I go on Facebook, I say, I'm not going to be on Facebook for three months. And they say, it's, it's liberating, because they're spending three to four hours a day, you know, nurturing their relationships. Is that the good? Is that a flourishing life? One of the areas of internet addiction comes with social networking among women, particularly. Aye, yeah. There are active Christian institutions like, like Pugwash, like uh, those that are pursuing human trafficking. And the, these bring us alive again but they also threaten us and we need moral courage to address, uh, to address them in order to love the Lord our God with all our heart and mind and soul and strength. All of it. God is our Lord, not the I God. Beware of the I God. It's there, it's here. Our idolatries are more internal than we may know. So I, I end with this effort of just trying to move us to thinking and maybe considering with our families, with our friends, how we can do this. The worksheets are much more practical. Um, my babbling has gone long enough. The humiliation of the word is evident. Thank you. Thank you.